Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome now to the fifth week of this fall series I've loved so much, at least myself. We're calling it Eighth Grade Faith. We've said that if you grew up Catholic, for many of you that meant going to Catholic school. If you didn't go to Catholic school, you went to something called CCD or Religious Ed, just like I did. And if any of your experience was like my experience, at least for my generation and many younger people as well, it was not something memorable. It was even boring or bad. Here's the thing. The kind of transactional nature in Catholic Church world, and I don't think just in the Catholic Church, but typically parents bring their kids to the church for First Communion, then they bring to their kids to the church for confirmation, and then they feel like they've done their job, they've done their best, they can relax. And at least for me, and many people like me, that left me as an eighth grader hearing the message, well, you're an adult in the Catholic Church now. And many people have looked around at other adults in the Catholic Church. They didn't want to be part of that club. And so as soon as they could, maybe when they were 18 years old, they found the exit doors. And effectively, effectively, confirmation was graduation. Graduation from church, from religion, from faith formation, from all that Catholic going to mass stuff, you name it. And that, that is the issue. You know, perhaps if your kid is like that or your grandkid, they're not bad people, they're good people. They even believe in God. But frankly, honestly, they have an eighth grade faith. And that's what we're dealing with and delving into in the course of this series. And I've said that in every other aspect in our life, we've matured, we've grown, we're challenged to, we have to, in order to be functioning adults. Can you only imagine trying to be uh, functioning in your life in any way with an eighth grade maturity? And so the idea is that we can, as adults, take, take a more useful approach to our faith. And I'm not trying to impose any guilt or judgment on anyone here. We can take a more life-giving and useful approach to apply our faith to better our life. Because our faith is meant to better our life. So that's what we've been looking at. We looked at our image of God growing up. How are you taught to view God? We should view God as a loving Father who does call us to obedience, but not obedience out of fear, but out of love. And then we looked at being good stewards with the time we have, with the resources we have. You only live once. Everything is a gift from God. So you might as well live the best life you can. We can't take our stuff with us, but we can send it ahead. We can have an eternal perspective. Then we looked at the idea that religion sometimes is just an extracurricular activity or something you took in school as a subject. Instead, our faith, our religion should be a lifestyle choice. And last week, if you were with us, I talked about prayer and how most people growing up were just taught to recite prayers, kind of like a monologue, instead of truly entering in to prayer, to listen to God and his voice. If you missed any of these past messages, it's also a great way to share it with anybody in your life who needs to hear these messages You can go to our website, scroll down, you'll find the encores on our YouTube channel. And there, if you know how to do it, you can share those messages with others. Now today, we're going to talk about uh, another aspect of our faith formation growing up. I just invite you to think about little kids and how they receive information. Just think about it. It's amazing. Little kids are sponges. And they're learning and gaining all kinds of facts all the time. I see it now with my niece, just absorbing all this information. I remember as a kid, my little brother Matt, he was this little genius. He learned everything there was to know about all the presidents at the age of maybe four or five years old. And then I, as a kid, I remember in fourth grade, I learned all 50 states. I learned all of them, and I learned a song. I'm not going to sing the song to you because I still remember it in my head. But this is something that's just uh, imposed on us. We learn a lot of facts. Do we verify those facts? Do we verify, for example, that the earth is round? Well, you learned that as a kid. Did you test that theory? No, you just accept that information. 
I've never been to several of the states, but I trust that they exist. And see, the thing about our faith is that we learn a lot of information as kids in school. Our, our kids learn the questions at confirmation that the bishop's going to ask them, for example. You learn the Baltimore Catechism maybe back in the day. But the thing about our faith is that it has to become personal. Our faith has to go from exterior teaching to an interior reality that drives our way of life. Let me say that again. Our faith as adults should move from exterior knowledge and teaching to an interior reality that drives our life. That is a personal faith. Now the good news is that there are a couple of things that are, are for us in this, in this endeavor, in our own experience. So for example, you have experienced this in getting married and having kids, if you're married and have kids. So maybe as a young bachelor or bachelorette, back in the day you thought, I'm never gonna get married. I don't wanna live the married life, the old ball and chain. But then you met her. Marriage went from being something out there to being someone. Same thing with your kids. You looked at your friends who already had kids, and you thought, those little creatures, those little brats, I don't want to have any of those. And you thought, wow, I, can't, I just don't understand how my friends are so attached to these little ones here. And then you had kids of your own. And parenting went from being something to being someone, or several someones. It became personal. And the other thing going for us is this. As Catholics, we understand that in baptism, that in confirmation, the Holy Spirit is within us. God's life and love is within us. And even if that fire of the Holy Spirit is dead, even if we are atheists and walk away from God for portions of our life, that fire of God's love and the most holy trinity can always be revived. We can always be reconnected with God. And as baptized Christians, we're part of something much, much bigger. The body of Christ. The mystical body of Christ. And therefore, if there are other people in your life, a spouse, your grandmother, even your kids, who have a deep relationship with God, that's contagious. That's infectious. That will positively affect the people around them. We can turn to them for a good example. But what is one major factor, one major issue that often brings people to a more personal, intimate, interior faith? That's what we'll look at today. And to look at that one thing, we'll look at the first reading today from the second book of Kings. So the books of Kings in the Old Testament are books that tell the story of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judea after the time of the great king, David. And there are many colorful characters in these books in the Old Testament, if you've ever read them. We're going to look at one such colorful character by the name of Naaman. Naaman was not an Israelite. He was outside the people of Israel. He was, in fact, a general in the army of Syria who were neighbors of Israel, and they were enemies of Israel. And Naaman is the protagonist in this story that we heard in 2 Kings chapter 5. He is a great guy. He's a wonderful man, but he's got a major, major problem. And so we hear this at the beginning of that chapter. Naaman, the army commander of the king of Aram, Aram is Syria, was highly esteemed and respected by his master, for through him the Lord had brought victory to Aram. But valiant as he was, the man was a leper. So Naaman, we're introduced to him here, is a powerful figure. He's valiant, he's courageous, he's highly respected by everyone around him, but he has been struck by a terrible sickness. Leprosy, at that time, was a death sentence. Leprosy meant that you were going to die a slow, slow, agonizing, painful death with your skin deteriorating over time. There's no cure. But not only was there a physical pain, a physical suffering, there also was the societal isolation because leprosy was thought of as being contagious. 
And so therefore you were, you were put in isolation from the rest of the community. So that's the position of Naaman here in this story. And then next we hear of an unlikely character. So we're told the Arameans had captured from the land of Israel and arrayed a little girl who became the servant of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would present himself to the prophet in Samaria, he would cure him of leprosy. So uh, the army of Aram of Syria, led by Naaman, had previously raided Israel, and they captured this little girl. And this little girl, who became a servant in the retinue of Naaman, knew about this great prophet in Israel, called Samaria here. And his name was Elisha. Elisha is a very important, powerful prophet in the first and second book of Kings. You can read all about him. He was the protege of the prophet Elijah. He was known as a miracle worker. So in the course of this story, there are some twists and turns. Naaman eventually decides, I'm going to head out to Israel, and I'm going to encounter this guy. And I'll do what it takes. He's a wealthy guy. So he brings along this retinue, this huge caravan of all this, these goods, this wealth. He's willing to pay whatever price it takes to receive healing from the prophet Elisha. So you can just imagine this scene, this quite colorful scene of this long caravan of these very important looking people pulling up right in front of this tiny little cottage in Israel where Elisha lived, very simply, in a tiny little college. A cottage, a tiny little hut. And what happens is that Naaman goes and knocks on the door, but Elisha doesn't come out. He just says through his messenger, he says to Naaman, go and, and bathe and be immersed in the river Jordan seven times, and then you'll be cured. And how does Naaman react? Well, he's, he, is, he is insulted. How dare this man do this to me? Does he know who I am? He doesn't even want to face me face to face and tell me this. I was expecting him to perform some magic over me and pray over me. And I'm willing to pay him whatever it takes. And not only that, he's telling me to go to this little creek. If you've ever been to the Holy Land, the River Jordan is the most unimpressive thing you've ever seen. There are creeks here in the Poconos that are bigger and cleaner than the River Jordan, which because it's very dry there, it's very muddy. So Naaman just is refusing to do this because he's prideful. He has to get over his pride. And luckily, luckily there's a, an advisor who tells him otherwise. So we hear later on in this story this. But his servants came up and reasoned with him. My father, if the prophet told you to do something extraordinary, would you not do it? And all the more since he told you, wash and be clean. So just because it's Something simple doesn't mean it's not worth doing. And so he does it. So Naaman went down and plunged into the Jordan seven times at the word of Elisha, the man of God. His flesh became again like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean of his leprosy. So Naaman has obeyed. He came over his pride. He found, he found healing. He found reconciliation. But even more importantly, a few verses later, he receives and declares a greater gift. Because he says, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. So Naaman, this foreigner, this Gentile, has come to faith in the God of Israel. He's come to know him personally. We could assume that previously he heard about the God of Israel. Previously, he maybe read about him or heard for the prophets of Israel speak about God, but it was through, first of all, his pain, his suffering, and second of all, his surrender of his ego, of his pride that led him to healing and that led him to a personal faith. So my friends, this can happen for all of us. The thing that can awaken us, that can awaken us to a deeper personal faith is our suffering. It's our pain. It could be physical pain. 
It could be emotional pain. It could be grief. It could be trauma. It could be financial pain. It could be anything in the past and present that hurts our heart. And just like Naaman, it's about an exchange. It's about an exchange of handing over all of our brokenness, all of our need of healing, to find healing in wholeness, to hand over our sinfulness, the ways that we have fallen short of God's love, and to receive a clean slate, to receive forgiveness. It's about handing over our pride and our ego and our will to receive God's peace and to, and to receive God's power. That's the process that you and I can come to a deeper personal faith, to not just know about God externally, but to know God, the depth of our being. Just a little story about myself. Uh, as I said during the series, I didn't have a prayer life or a personal relationship with God all through my teen years and my adolescence. I went to church, but I was just going through the motions. It was only much later that I develop, developed those things. But as many of the parishioners know, there was a major experience in my life when I was just 14 years old. On March 6, 1992, my youngest brother, Aaron, who was three years old, along with another little boy, Paul Schaefer, tragically drowned in the pond behind our house. It was an experience, a tragedy that affected the course of my family life, all my brothers, my parents, very, very deeply. And at the age of 14, I wasn't really ready to process that grief and that sorrow. I remember dreaming that my brother Aaron was going to come back to life. And as I grew in my teen years, yeah, I started to learn about God and prayer. I started to serve more. I started to hear God's voice as I got into my 20s, calling me to a seminary to try out the priesthood. But even then, even then, I hadn't processed this grief and this trauma in my heart and my psyche. And so it was the process through seminary life that I went and I saw, I had the opportunity to speak to a psychiatrist for some time, actually for about three years, to process these things. And I was dealing with anxiety, I was dealing with depression, but, but handing these over to God to find others to help me, to walk with me, I remember the summer of 2005. It was very specific. I was on a retreat in Omaha, Nebraska, of all places, and there, for the first time, I discovered the personal love of God. The personal love of God the death of the most holy trinity, calling me to surrender, calling me to hand over that pain and that grief to know him and to love him more deeply. And that was just one part, a major part of me continuing on to serve as a priest. So what's your story? What's your story? You see, when it comes down to it, if we heard in the gospel, Jesus calls us to give thanks to him. Why? Because he died for you and me. Look at that cross. He died for you and me. Because he loves you and me that much. If there was only two people in the world, me and Jesus, he would have died for me. If there were only two people in the world, you and Jesus, he would have died for, me, for you. That's how much he loves you. And so... What I'm going to do here at the end of this message is something a little different, something just a little different. You're invited to be part of it. If not, you don't have to. But this is a chance for you, if you've never done this to you, to declare like Naaman, to declare like Naaman a faith that's personal. And along with it, just like Naaman, is an exchange, perhaps of pride and ego. Perhaps there is a place in your heart that you have to let God go there. You have to let God go there, like a room in your house, a closet in your house that you've kept locked all these years. Maybe you even threw away the key. God can open that door, but he's waiting for you to, to say yes, to, to go there, to let him go there. And so in a, just a short while, I'm going to put up a prayer on the screen. And if you've already done this in your life, because we're part of the body of Christ, 
You can do it for somebody else. Do it for somebody else in your life, a loved one who needs to experience this healing and this personal faith. So I put this prayer up together, and let's pray together. We pray. Heavenly Father, I want to experience the healing of Naaman. I want to know personally your power and your presence in my life. I accept that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for me. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son so that I can be made whole. Today, as best I can, I surrender to you so that I can move into a more personal relationship with you. I make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen.